Great. Okay, so thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'm, I'm Leo Reardon. I am a senior quantum software developer at Xanadu, and I'm currently the performance lead for the Penny Lane software product. So I'm going to give a quick overview of this, uh, what we call large scale hybrid quantum workflows with Penny Lane. And the general idea is, first of all, I'll introduce everybody to what Penny Lane is, uh, you know, our, our kind of goal for the project, uh, for, the, for the library, uh, discuss a little bit about integrating it with HPC tooling and software, and then move on to the results we've had for, for, uh, from using Perlmutter over the, the past year. So great. So yeah, I, I'll just give a quick introduction to Penny Lane first. So Penny Lane itself is, in our eyes, the kind of the, the best way of allowing a researcher to kind of build these state-of-the-art kind of hybrid and device agnostic quantum algorithms. So one of our kind of real, I guess, powerful points is that Penny Lane allows you to incorporate multiple different types of devices in a single workflow. So if you want to offload your device to a Xanadu device, to a simulator, to a given hardware, you can do this all in, in a single circuit. And you know we have multiple users who you know build their own devices, build support for their own hardware, and you build their own simulators. And so you know we have a fairly large community, a large number of contributors, uh, both you know in, inside and outside the research communities themselves. And you know we're really kind of quite happy with uh, how people are using it. So another thing I should say is we work with a lot of people in a lot of places, right? So from the hardware side. You know, we're, we're building our own uh, our own hardware at Xanadu. Uh, from the software side, we partner with a lot of different organizations and uh, and companies to add support to Penny Lane, to make use of Penny Lane. And, you know, from the applications point of view as well, we do a lot of uh, development and research with uh, with other organizations. And so the goal of this is to kind of support quantum programming really on, on any platform. Okay, so we really want to make sure that, you know, no matter what hardware you have available, you should be able to build an example within Penny Lane and to use Penny Lane for your uh, your hardware access. So it'd be that, you know, integrated photonics for our own stack, whether it be superconducting qubits, simulators, trapped ions. We want to make sure you can also integrate your workflows into machine learning tools like Torch, TensorFlow, and JAX, as well as making use of, you know, HPC platforms and cloud native platforms. Okay, so we do this with kind of this composition of hybrid quantum and classical uh, design philosophy. And we treat quantum circuits themselves as, you know, natively differentiable. So any quantum circuit that can accept the parameter should be able to be trained based on that parameter. And a user should be able to kind of build a overall hybrid workflow by combining these trainable circuits as well as their classical model and build something that's better than the sum of its parts. So if you have some type of quantum problem that evaluates and gives results to some classical neural network or to some other part of a pipeline and then offloads to another quantum device, we want to make that as seamless as possible with Penny Lane. And we do this with some help from what we call quantum nodes or Q nodes. So this is where the and the integration comes with, uh, with you know, quantum computers and classical scientific libraries within Penny Lane. So if you have made use of TensorFlow, JAX, or Torch in the past, you notice that they might have these native uh, tensor-like objects. And with these native tensor-like objects, they each have their own way of tracking gradients uh, or tracking the, the operations through, through a classical uh, machine learning model. So to make sure that we kind of have a nice integration with the quantum circuits, we unwrap these tensors, we feed them into our quantum circuits in the most efficient way, and then we convert the output of a quantum circuit back into a tensor again. So as far as what goes on inside the Q node, the classical machine learning frameworks don't care, but within the Q node itself, it can be simulating a quantum circuit, it could be hardware that you know, passes on the parameters to build the circuit and do evaluations or, or some kind of hybrid combination. Okay, so just a quick overview as well. Uh, there's plenty of examples to go around. Uh, you know, Penny Lane has kind of put you know education at the forefront for you know upcoming and you know cutting edge research. So we build examples from papers all the time. And if you're kind of looking to know more, I would suggest visiting the the Penny Lane AI QML website. And you know, we have cross compliance. Mean, you know, we, we we don't stick to just our own simulators. You know, there's there's devices there which are you know, non-Xanadu non devices, we have, uh, you know, GPU simulations, CPU simulations, everything you might want to see. Okay, now that the, the Penny Lane introduction is out of the way, let's get on to the HPC side. So one of the, the main focuses we've kind of had over the, the past year is making sure that Penny Lane is natively supported with uh, 
with, with, with HPC hardware, right? I mean, we see these, you know, the development of quantum computers and software for quantum computers to be very tightly integrated with, with HPC uh, platforms. So we kind of started by focusing on ensuring Penny Lane has, I guess, suitability and tooling, which, you know, is native to the HPC based space. So right now, there was a lot of focus, at least, on integrating it with CUDA and especially Ku Quantum from NVIDIA to make sure we can, you know, definitely take advantage of those A100s on Perlmutter in the in the, the most efficient way. We also have native, you know, C++ back simulators, which are offloading with OpenMP uh, to make sure that we can, you know, always run well on the given hardware, as well as a new support for for Cocos, which we are I'll, I'll discuss briefly in, in the following slide. Uh, some of the other work we're doing, obviously, I mentioned the machine learning framework integration. So PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, these are natively supported with Penny Lane, and you can easily build a, a hybrid quantum job that will work within a given, a, a given workflow for, for these platforms. And last on the list, we're discussing distributed workloads, not with MPI this time, but with Ray and Dask, right? So, I mean, these are... You know, if anyone has ever played with the likes of Ray or Dask, these are great tools for, for task-based computation and, you know, they natively support distribution of, of, of workloads and, you know, we've had great success with that. And I'll come back to Ray as well when I discuss the results on Perlmutter. So just to give a quick overview as well of our software suite. So this is the busiest slide on the deck. You know, I'm sorry for the words, but it's just easy to have it all on, on one place. So... We want to make sure that Penny Lane runs on everything, and we want to make sure that Penny Lane runs fast on everything. So to start with that, we built a device which we call Lightning.Qubit, which is a modern C++ 20 code base. So the idea is that if you have a modern compiler, it will run natively. And uh, we support batching of observables with gradients. So one of the things with Penny Lane is we want to make sure that gradients are supported natively. And you're going to be calculating gradients with respect to observables in your circuit. So we can independently batch these observables over OpenMP threads um, on, on a given, on a given uh, CPU system. One of the next things we kind of added recently, which was this automatically dispatch SIMD gate kernels. So in this case, that if you have support for you know, AVX 512 on your hardware or AVX2 or even just AVX, we should be able to query what gate sets you should automatically support and our internal dispatcher will choose which set of operations will be the most performance on your system. And the nice thing here is you don't actually need to compile this from scratch to make it work. You just do pip install any lane. You get this on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. And so this is kind of our, our bare bones, fast, you know, fastest uh, simulator that we built up until a few months back. And obviously recently we've been focusing a lot on Lightning GPU, which is our Ku Quantum back simulator. So with this, you know, we're getting the best performance on NVIDIA hardware, but we have also implemented some native GPU support for what's called adjoint backpropagation. Forgive me for adjoint backpropagation. And so this is kind of a way of efficiently evaluating quantum circuit gradients in, I guess, the most performant manner for, for, for classical hardware, where you have actually where you have actual access to a state vector. And last but not least, we have multi-GPU support for the batching of these uh, observable gradients as part of this device as well. And so if you want to install this, you know, assuming you're running on a Linux machine, you do pip install any lane lightning GPU and pip install Ku Quantum and you're ready to go. Again, no, no compilation needed. And lastly, the Cocos device is one that I, I want to just draw a little bit of focus to. So this is something we've put together recently because we want to make sure we can support pretty much any accelerator that's uh, you know, available on the market right now, as well as you know, coming out over the next uh, year or two. And this automatically multi-threads our gate kernels uh, for us, you know, over OpenMP or C++ threads, depending on how you compile it. But we also support CUDA natively. We support HIP and Rockham if you want to compile for AMD GPUs and Sickle if you want to compile for a Sickle supported platform. Okay, so why, why all of the tools, right? Uh, a goal, I guess, at Xanadu is, you know, to build quantum computers that are useful for people. And at least with what I was kind of describing here was making sure that all the tools we build with Penny Lane are, are useful. So making sure that anybody who intends to use Penny Lane should be able to build whatever workflow they want using that tooling, and especially making use of HPC hardware. So I'm going to focus a little bit now on, you know, variational quantum optimization problems and take a little bit of a detour as well into something called circuit cutting. Okay. 
So let's focus a little bit on variational al al algorithms and gradients. Okay, so the general idea with a variational algorithm or you know a parametric quantum circuit, if you will, is you have some set of parameters and you have some quantum circuit which will accept these parameters and you can treat this as a function, effectively a black box function where you know your function is your circuit, your parameters can be passed in and then based on your incoming parameters, the output from your quantum circuit um, Will, will, will differ depending on the algorithm you're putting together. One of the big things that I guess we, we tend to support in Penny Lane, as I mentioned, is native gradient support. Okay, so we wanna be able to make sure that these parameters we're passing in can be updated based on some cost function or some relative gradients that we are, are, are interested in evaluating. So this allows us to effectively navigate a potential landscape and find some type of solution to to a given problem that is of interest to us. Okay, so next on the list, I wanna say is quantum circuits are natively differentiable provided they're parametric. And in this case, this is easily supported in Penny Lane uh, right, right out of the gate. And so one of the, I guess two of the, the given methods that are you know most, I guess, prominently known being, one is finite difference. We're all familiar with this from even classical types of problems, but in the quantum world, we also have parameter shift. And this is kind of a way of saying we can build gradients from multiple executions of quantum circuits. And we, we know the scaling for these, it's you know for n parameters we're passing in, we need on the order of two n evaluations of quantum circuits. And this is a, a method that will apply to you know, classical hardware, to quantum hardware, or you know, some any hybrid hardware that we're we're putting together. And it will be exact if we're using parameter shift or it will be approximate if we're using finite difference. But the general idea is we need to evaluate lots of circuits if we have lots of parameters. And this can cause a problem depending on the type of workload you're trying to put together. Okay, a quick detour for a moment. So I'm gonna talk about circuit cutting for the next minute or so and just say that a tensor network is a quantum circuit as a tensor network is a quantum circuit, right? So these things are, are interchangeable depending on how you formulate your problem. And you can always convert a tensor network into a quantum circuit or a quantum circuit into a tensor network, provided you choose the appropriate operations that are supported by both, both paradigms. And in this regime, you can apply methods that work in tensor networks to you know, native state vector simulation in quantum circuits. And some of the, you know, the issues we can do, or one of the, the behaviors we can do on a tensor network is you know, cutting the, the indices of you know, connecting um, connecting tensors or cutting the gates themselves or which it would be the, the tensors. So we can effectively distribute and break these components apart and kind of evaluate them independently of another. And with that, we can actually do this to quantum circuits too. So take for example, a 60 qubit quantum circuit. You know, this is not going to be runnable on a, you know, a state vector simulator for, uh, unless we have some very, very amazing improvements in, in memory over the next few years, I don't think this is ever going to be the case. However, we can, you know, assuming that we have an appropriately built problem, decompose this into, a, a, you know, a large number of smaller circuits that can potentially fit on the available hardware. And with, you know, physical quantum systems coming online and, you know, logical uh, qubits that will be available on these systems, we kind of expect that there will be limits to what we can run for, you know, for the uh, for the hardware as it becomes available. And so the idea with this is to be able to break a problem down into bite-sized chunks that can be run on, on quantum hardware. And so by taking this method, we can break circuits up, we can stitch them back together classically after we evaluate all of their individual components. And the nice thing being that we can effectively evaluate all of these cuts uh, independently from one another. And you can ask them, you know, can we farm these out to, you know, combinations of CPUs, GPUs, QPUs? And the answer is yes, obviously. This is kind of one of the, the nice things we've kind of shown with this work. But first, I want to do another quick detour into an example of how you can do this in Penny Lane. So this is our quantum circuit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a two qubit device, which in this case is our lightning qubit simulator. Next, I'm going to enable our circuit cutting functionality in Penny Lane. And then I'm going to build a three qubit parametric circuit, right? So obviously, you know, if you're trying to simulate a three qubit problem on a two qubit device, you're going to run into issues. However, by adding this wire cut, we can effectively say, okay, we can just, you can break this uh, circuit into, into multiple pieces, which will be smaller than, than the original, um, than the original composition. And then we can evaluate some type of uh, expectation value on it. 
So the idea is that we want to make sure this is as seamless as possible for the user. And circuit cutting and stitching is effectively hidden behind the scenes. So as far as you're concerned, you just tell it to do the circuit cutting, and it evaluates everything as though it's a three qubit circuit. You will, you know, pass in your your parameter there, which this requires grad equals true. Make sure that you know your system is trainable. Uh, you can evaluate your circuit with the parameter, or you can evaluate the gradient of the circuit relative to that parameter. And you know this this works out of the box with uh, with Penny Lane currently. Okay, so now we talk about scaling this up. So circuit execution for for this type of problem, you know, it it, it runs into lots of evaluations pretty quickly. And the idea is we can kind of take this single forward pass of a quantum circuit by passing in parameters, breaking it apart with our circuit cutting, and then evaluating it as a, as a given function into this type of a workflow, where the circuit transform is effectively cutting our circuit down into smaller chunks. We evaluate these circuits independently of one another. We get an output. And then using this post-processing uh, classical uh, reduction, we can bring the results back into, into one um, one numeric value of interest. And as I mentioned before, gradients are also of interest to us. So as we're calculating more gradients, each slice of a gradient is effectively a forward pass execution in this framework. And uh, if you're passing in lots of parameters and you want to calculate lots of gradients, well, you need to scale up the number of evaluations you have to do independently. So this is kind of the workload we would expect to see for, for a large scale run using this type of circuit cutting plus uh, quantum gradients workload. And what are we doing this for? Well, the idea is to do quantum parameter optimization for QAOA. And you know the, the results in the paper uh, listed at the bottom of the page are there. I would suggest everybody to have a read. There's some very nice analytical results, but I'm most interested in numerics in this, uh, in this talk. And so the idea is we can kind of use this workload where we're building the forward pass, we're building the, the gradients, and we can use this to calculate variation, variational energy for, for QA, QAOA problems. So the first one I'm going to demonstrate is a 129 qubit problem, and then look at variational parameter optimization of a 62 qubit problem that fits into this uh, into this result space. So onto the numerics. While well, I have, I think, about two minutes left. So yeah, in terms of variational energy calculation, we kind of hit a up to 129 qubits, and we had some very nice analytical results that allowed us to evaluate the same uh, the same results for the problems we were looking at. So in this case, we have you know, two QAOA circuit layers, we have 25 nodes per QAOA uh, cluster, and we have one node per intercluster connection. So, I mean, this is kind of building our problem graph. And the idea is we can kind of increase the number of clusters to increase the qubit requirements of our problem. And so we were able to kind of run this nicely with Penny Lane just uh, out of the gate. And the second problem we had was looking at this parameter optimization of the 62 qubits. So for, param for, for certain parameters of certain QAOA circuits, you can kind of evaluate the cost function analytically, which was great to have something to compare to. But in regimes where you actually cannot compare analytically, we were able to show that you know these numerics actually hold up quite well. And you know some runtimes, kind of for one problem, we were looking at two GPU nodes for half an hour. For a little bit more of a complex problem, twelve hours on ten GPU nodes. And you know the the idea is these numerics were to support the the theory of of the paper. So again, I would suggest anyone interested, feel free to, to jump back and have a read. And so building this, we employed a few tools. Uh, we use Penny Lane to do all of the problem definition, the circuit cutting and everything. We actually use Ray as part of the orchestration of each of the individual circuits. For every Ray uh, remote task, we use NVIDIA's Kube Quantum uh, simulator as part of our, our GPU simulating device. And then obviously the uh, the wonderful Perlmutter to, to do all of the heavy lifting. So. We were quite happy to see you know, some very you know, decent scaling results for this. Um, obviously it's, you know, strong scaling. So we had a very fixed problem size. We could definitely make it harder, heavier, and make sure that we scale better with uh, with different problems. But in terms of what we wanted, you know, we were very happy with the results. So all of the the data I, I've shown here today is in this is in this uh, you know re repository on GitHub, and you know that is pretty much it from me. So I'll say thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions, and you know feel free to reach out if there's any comments of of anything on on the above.